encouragement that's nothing to do with the sermon um, from, I read this this morning, um, in Zechariah chapter 8, and it talks about just what happens when God's people catch a vision of how great he is, um, that people would say to each other, let us go and entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty, I myself am going. And we prayed that downstairs, that people would this afternoon say, I'm, I'm going, let's go and meet with God. And I just felt, um, as we were worshipping, God want to commend some of us who this afternoon had that conversation in our house, like, I'm going, you know, you might not want to, some of you may have won that battle with your kids or whatever else, some of you may have lost that battle, but just that God sees that when you say, I'm going, I want to meet with God, that he sees that, so I just wanted to encourage you with that. Um, Okay, so this is our second Sunday looking at the book of Colossians, it's a letter, it's a letter from a guy called Paul to a church in a place called Colossae. Um, And the whole point of this that we looked at last week is Paul wants to remind this church of their identity in Christ. We looked at the difference between being in and out last week, and he wants them to see that being in Jesus changes absolutely everything. What should be the centre of our lives? Paul's answer is... Jesus. He should be the centre. Um, if he were a mathematician, he might have used an equation that looks like the one that Chris is going to put up. Everything minus Jesus equals nothing. If you have everything in the world, but you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. But if you have Jesus and nothing else, you have everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. If you want to change, if you're here this afternoon thinking, I want to change some way in my life, Jesus is the answer. If you want to know peace, Jesus is the answer. If you want purpose in your life, Jesus is the answer. And this church in Colossae, they were tempted to add to this equation. They were tempted to go Jesus plus Jewish customs, Jesus plus pagan philosophies. And we can be the same, right? We can think, okay, Jesus plus politics, Jesus plus culture wars, the hobbies, hobby horse we want to get on. Am I ringing quite a bit? Is this mic doing that? Shall I swap with that one? Cool. I'll just use that one because it's easy. Um, yeah, we can think, okay, it, Jesus, but let's add other things to him. Let's add my job. Let's add the YouTube rabbit hole I go down. Let's add my sport, my family. These things are going to help me. These things are everything to me, Jesus plus. But the reality is when we add stuff to Jesus, we actually take away from him. If you have a bucket that's full of water and you try and put something, if it's full right to the brim and you put something else in, what happens to the water that's in there? It gets displaced. If you've packed your suitcase for holiday and it's completely full and you try and add something to it, then you end up taking stuff out. If we try and add things to Jesus, then we actually detract from him. Jesus is everything that we need. And so in the next part of this letter, Paul is going to answer two really, really important questions for us. First question is this, how do you know you're a Christian? Right? If Jesus is everything, how do you know that you have him? Question number two, how do you grow as a Christian? If Jesus really is everything, how do I get hold of that? You know, if he's all that I need, what does that look like? So how do you know you're a Christian? How do you grow as a Christian? So let me read it, and then we're going to dive in. So it's Paul writing, and actually he gives us a little insight into these things by telling us what he's praying for this church. He says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. That's Paul's definition of a Christian, someone who truly understands God's grace. That's what it means to be a Christian. You learned it from Epaphras, God's grace, the gospel, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might 
so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so the first question is, how do you know that you're a Christian? Well, it's not being born in a Christian country. People have said if you were born in McDonald's, you're not a Big Mac. It's not being a good person. It's not just doing good deeds. Plenty of people do good things, but they're not Christians. It's not going to church and reading the Bible. It's not even being a pastor and doing this and talking to a church. I've heard stories of preachers who became Christians while they were preaching. So just the very act of standing up and preaching doesn't mean that you're a Christian. What does it mean? How do you know that you've truly understood God's grace? And Paul here, he gives two bits of evidence that he's grateful for to God for these Colossians. He says, there's two things I can see in your life that show that a third thing is true, that you've truly got the gospel. The first thing he says is this, you've got faith. That's the first bit of evidence that someone is truly a Christian. He says, we thank God when we pray for you because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. What is faith? We can be tempted to think faith is a blind leap in the dark. It's saying, I'm just going to believe that even though there might not be any proof of it. The way that the Bible talks about faith is that it's faith that's based on something. Did you see what it says here? Faith in Christ Jesus. Faith based on evidence about a person, who Jesus is. The Colossians, Paul says, they have faith in Christ Jesus. And he doesn't say that Christ Jesus as an accident. We can think that Christ is Jesus' last name, right? And maybe he was having a bad day writing and he's got it the wrong way around, Smith John or something. But it doesn't. The reason that he says Christ Jesus is because Christ is a title. It's the Greek version of the Hebrew word Messiah. He says you've got faith in Jesus as the Messiah. It's a title like you could say Dr. Kate or Kate the Doctor. He says here, Jesus is the Messiah, and that's what you've grasped. You know, the whole of the Old Testament is about the fact that God is going to send someone to rescue the world. And, and in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 9, a few different things that we can pick out that God says about this Messiah, they're going to be born as a baby. They're going to have a divine nature. They're going to be called God. And they're going to have a kingdom of righteousness and justice that is never, ever going to end. So the Messiah is going to be born as a baby, going to live forever and have a kingdom that is going to be perfect forever and ever and ever. And that's what the Colossians had come to believe was true about Jesus. That Jesus was the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. That when Jesus lived, he lived not just as a man, but as God. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die a tragic death, that he actually died the death that God had planned before all of eternity to rescue sinful people like you and me. That's what the Colossians believed, and that when Jesus rose from the dead, what the Messiah was doing was ushering in the new kingdom of God where there would be no more pain or injustice or despair ever again. That Jesus was the beginning of what God will one day do when Jesus returns, which is remaking the whole world. This world is so broken, isn't it? There's so many things with this world. There are so many things that are wrong in, in my life, in your life. The promise of the Bible, the hope of the Bible is that when Jesus returns, all of those things will be put right. That's what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to remake this world. No more pollution, no more global warming, no more slavery. He's going to make it all new again. And these people, they believed it. They had faith in Jesus based on evidence. It says here they learned it from Epaphras. So Epaphras was a guy who would have gone along and said to them, hey guys, let me tell you about Jesus. And I bet they didn't give Epaphras an easy time. I bet they'd have been like, Jesus? That's like, loads of people have that name. What's special about this guy? And Epaphras would have said to them, let me tell you about what he's done. There's eyewitnesses that he died on a cross, that he rose again. There's all these people that say Jesus has changed their life. Let me tell you about what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came and miracles are happening. And they believed because they knew that there was evidence. So that's the first thing that Paul says. How do you know that you're a Christian? You have faith that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah, the promised one of God who's going to make the whole world new again. And their faith is put in action. 
So faith is based on evidence. I don't know if you've ever seen a plane before, massive old thing. Have you ever actually looked at a plane and you've thought, there's no way that can fly? There is no way on earth that that could possibly fly. But when you see it, there's some evidence, isn't there? And you think, oh, somehow the physics works and it can stay in the air. It's one thing to have faith in something. It's another thing to put action to that faith. How do you action the faith in a plane? You get on it and you go, this is going to be okay. I'm not going to die. And in the same way, these Colossians, Paul says, have acted on their faith. He says, you love God's people. He says it in the end of verse 4. The love you have for all God's people. Have a look around this room for a second. Look a few people in the eye, awkwardly. We're not a particularly special group of people. Sorry to break it to you. And actually, none of us in this room are any easier to love than anyone out there. We all have things that make us frustrating to be around. I do definitely have many things that make it hard to love me. And Paul says about this church, the way I know your faith in Jesus is real is because you love all of God's people. You don't just come to church on Sunday and hang out with the people that you like, the people who are like you, the people who are easy to get along with. You really love all the people that God has put you in community with. That's one of the evidences that you're really a Christian. It's not just, I believe A, B, and C, but actually can't stand half of my church. I, I, you know, I'm happy to sit on Facebook and talk about how rubbish they all are. I'm happy to slag them off to my neighbors, or in my heart, I think I, you know, those people, they're rubbish. Part of the evidence that we have really, really grasped the grace and the love of God for us is that we really and truly love each other. So that leads, that's those two bits of evidence, their faith and their love, lead Paul to conclude that these people are really Christians. This is how he puts being a Christian. He says in verse 5, the faith and love that, you've, that I can see, they spring up from the hope stored for you in heaven about which you have heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. Being a Christian is someone for who the true message of the gospel has come to. Apparently the Greek word there doesn't even just mean like it's come to you as in like maybe someone might come to your house, but it's more like you've received it. You've, you've, it's gone in, inside of you. The gospel, you know that the gospel has gone inside of you, that it's really hit home when you can see faith and love. But he talks here about the gospel as a message of hope. That's what the gospel is, a message of hope. And he says their faith and their love spring up from hope. Hope in what? Hope in what? We can think hope, you know, I hope that my football team win, I hope that this happens, I hope maybe I get to go to heaven when I die. The way it talks about it here is hope that is stored up for you in heaven. What's in heaven right now? Any, any answers? What's in heaven right now? God's in heaven, yeah? Anything else? Say again. The Lord, yeah, yeah, God is in heaven. What else might be in heaven? Maybe angels, yeah? Any other things? It's a bit metaphysical, this. What's in heaven? Huh? The redeemed people of God? Huh? Disciples, yeah? There's all these things in heaven. Which one of those is our hope in? Is it in the angels? Is it in the other Christians who have gone before us? The hope that is stored up for us in heaven is actually centered on a person. It's centered on Jesus. Jesus is like an acorn, right? He's like an acorn of the new creation. What is stored up in an acorn? The potential for a whole oak tree, right? What is stored up in Jesus right now is the potential of a whole new creation, of a whole new world, of everything made new, of every tear being wiped away. And that potential will be realized on the day that Jesus returns. Our hope as Christians is that Jesus has overcome death, that when he came back from the dead, it wasn't just that he was like, one all now, you know, you killed me and I came back. It's actually that death has been undone, that death has been defeated and broken, and that life is going to reign for all of eternity when he comes back. So our hope as Christians is Jesus, that he is the one who's going to bring a new creation. And because of their faith and their love, he says to them, I know you're really a Christian. What about you? Have you truly understood God's grace? You can reverse engineer it by working out, have I put my faith in Jesus? 
Do I really believe all these things about him? And do I really love people? Maybe I've got so far intellectually, but it just hasn't hit my heart yet. If those things aren't true for you, then you're in the right place because we're a church where we want to be like Epaphras. We want to help people discover the truth of the grace of God for themselves. And we want to answer your questions and we want to walk on this journey with you. If you're not sure that you're a Christian, chat to someone that you know in this room who is a Christian and we run alpha courses which help people to discover Jesus for themselves or maybe you just need to ask some questions. Maybe you need to truly understand God's grace in a new way because the the gospel is a message right it's a message about who jesus is so that's how we know that we're christians because we have faith in jesus as the messiah because we love like jesus the messiah loves and our hope is placed in him not in anything else so in the five minutes i have left how do we grow as a christian i love this bit i could probably do a sermon on that i could probably just stop here and do this bit next week but i'm not going to do that how do we grow as Christians? Just think about for a second um, a friendship that you have. How does a friendship grow? So maybe you discover that you have something in common with someone. So maybe you discover you're both fans of Star Wars. So you find some, you discover this knowledge about this person. We both like Star Wars. So then what you do is you act on that knowledge. You're like, let's do a Star Warsy thing together. Let's go around one of our houses and we'll watch one of the films. Um, not, the ones, not the episode one, two, and three, because they're rubbish, but either the really old ones or the new ones, because they're quite good. And then as you do something together, as you act on that knowledge, you learn more things. Oh, this person is, they like Domino's pizza. Let's order a Domino's. So you, you find something out, you do something with it. Then you discover, oh no, they're a vegan. And then, you, and then so on and so forth, right? So that's the way that friendship grows. It's like a spiral. You know things, you act on them, which helps you know more things, which helps you act on them, which helps you know more things. That is what Paul says is true for us as Christians, how we grow. If you're here this afternoon and you're like, I've stopped growing as a Christian, like zoom in on this. This is really, really important for us. This is what Paul prays for these Colossians about how they're going to grow. He says, verse 9, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We We continually ask that God would fill you with the knowledge of his will, no, and all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live, do, live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing, in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. He prays that they'd know God's will, that they'd act on what they know about his will, that they'd know more about God, and that they would therefore do more based on what they have learned. So let's just zoom in on this spiral for a second. The first thing he says is, I pray that you would know God's will. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. We can read that as individualistic 21st century Christians and think, when he says, I want you to know God's will, what he means is God's will for my life, who I'm going to marry, what job I'm going to have, where I should move, and what stocks or shares I should buy. That's not what he's talking about. He's not even talking about God's will for your life in terms of the type of character that you should have, the type of person that you should be. What he's talking about, because it doesn't say here, God's will for your life, he says the knowledge of God's will. What is God's will? What is God's master plan? It's that one day the Messiah is going to remake all things. That's the master plan. I love the video that Becky showed us at the start. It's not about us. We aren't the main character of our stories. If we're Christians, Jesus is the main character of our stories. God's will is that one day all of the mess of the sin and shame of this world is going to be done away with when Jesus returns. That is God's will. And he says, I want you, he prays that God is going to fill them with the knowledge of his will. Why? Why does he want them to know that? So that they'll act on it. You know, one of my favorite verses on the will of God in Habakkuk, uh, in the Bible, is in Habakkuk 2, verse 14, that says this. And just get this. Maybe even close your eyes and just, just imagine this. This is a promise from God. This is his will for this world. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. 
the earth, this earth, will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That is going to happen one day. That is God's will for this world. And you're part of that. And so am I. But he wants them to grasp that truth and therefore do something with it. And he says in verse 10, what do you do with it? You live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. You know when you go to the swimming pool, why do you put your bathers on, longer term, bathers, why do you put your bathers on in the changing room? Because you anticipate jumping in the pool, right? You don't need your bathers on in the changing room. You could stay in your clothes. It's not wet in there. You're fine. But you need to get changed. You need to get ready for the reality that you know is about to come, that you're about to jump into a pool. And that's what Paul says to these, these Colossians and to us. There is a reality coming, but the knowledge, the glory of God is going to flood this earth. So get dressed and get ready for it. Live a life now that makes sense then. Have your character, have your life, have your actions in a way that are in tune with that reality. Live a life worthy of the Lord. I wonder what kind of life you're living at the moment. I've thought myself this week, what kind of life am I living at the moment? Does my life fit more into this world and this reality? Or does it fit more into that world and that reality? That reality is one of justice and peace. How much am I interested in justice and peace? That reality is all about Jesus. How much am I all about Jesus? Or how much am I about me? And then he prays, keeps praying, that be when they live these types of lives based on the reality of that Jesus is coming back to make all things new, that that will lead them to know more about God. How do you know more about God? You could think, I read the Bible lots. I get lots of knowledge. The Bible is anti that. It says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You can sit in a study for all of your life and read the Bible, and you won't know any more about God than if you hadn't even started, unless you put into action the things that you know are true about God. Unless you are in a relationship with that God. It's one of the things that Jesus had to go at the Pharisees for. He said, you've studied the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you find life, but they point to me, and they'd missed him. And that's how this spiral works. When we act on what we know about God, we're able to learn more about him. We get more spiritual strength. But just for my last two minutes, just see how this works. When we understand something about God, that knowledge, as we put it into action changes us. He says here, verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. What's the truth about God that Paul points to there? God is mighty. We looked at it just now. Those, look at the, the galaxy, the stars. Has anyone seen the James Webb telescope pictures that came out this week? They're incredible, aren't they? God is the one who made all the stars. He is mighty, as we look at his might, we realize that we're weak and small, and therefore that we need to find our strength in him, and so we find our strength in him, which means that we get strengthened. When we look at God's strength, and we go to him in relationship, we become stronger spiritually. That's how it works. When we see something of the character of God, when we see the holiness of God, when we really understand it and we start to act on it, God, you're holy, so I should be holy, it makes us more holy and more able to appreciate his holiness. Just think about some of these examples for a second. Because I realize that in my life, one of the reasons that I stop growing as a Christian is that I either stop learning about God or I stop putting into practice what I know about him. So I wonder if you've ever done that. If you've ever been like, I know God is generous. I heard a sermon on that once. And I'm called to be generous because God is generous, but actually I fear not having enough. You know, it's a difficult time at the moment. And so I, I just, I'm not going to be generous. I'm going to put number one first. And what happens is that the truth about God being generous becomes further and further away from us. Uh, and the truth that he's the provider of all of our needs becomes small. And so we stall in our growth. We stop growing. 
Or maybe God is holy, he calls me to be holy, but, but I find lust a comforting thing in my life and I just don't want to let it go. I just, it's just too, it's just too help, like nice for me. It's something that, that I can't let go. It's too comforting. And so the longer I indulge that lust, the longer, and the longer I don't run from it, the further away the truth that God is holy feels. And I feel further from him. And so I stall in my growth. Or maybe you think, I know that God is committed to me. I know that truth, that God is faithful and just. He's steadfast. And so I should be steadfast because that's what I see in him. But actually, I like being able to use my time the way that I want to. And the idea of committing to church or to Hope Community or something else feels inconvenient. And as we, as we don't reflect the truth that we see in God, so that truth becomes smaller and smaller and further and further away. And so we stall and we stop growing. The only way that we can grow as Christians is to press into the character of God, to see how Jesus reveals God to us and to say to him, I want to be like you, and to start doing that, knowing that he will help us. So Paul, thank, Paul wants them to know that it's the knowledge of God as they act on it that's going to help them grow. And the last thing he says is he wants them to know God so that they can endure and be patient and be thankful. You know, just one word on the spiral, seeing who God is, acting on who God is. Sometimes we stall, don't we? Sometimes we, make, we, we just can't get off the ground. But you know, the overarching truth about who God is, is that he's gracious, is that he is a God of grace and mercy. And when we stall, he has the jump leads. When we say to him, God, I can't do this, I haven't been doing this, have mercy on me. He loves to come and to help us and to pull us out of the pit and to give us a second chance or a hundredth chance. And the thing that Paul end, will end with this last bit of the passage, he wants them to grow in the knowledge of God so that they can endure and so that they can be patient. He says to them in verse 13 and 14, he says that God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. It's good news, isn't it? God has been patient with us. He's rescued us from our darkness. He's been patient with us. So therefore, what's the truth that we should embody? We should be patient and we should endure because that kingdom is coming. I love this quote. N.T. Wright said, uh, endurance is what faith, hope, and love bring in a, to an apparently impossible situation. Patience is what they show to an apparently impossible person. I like that. When people are impossible, faith, hope, and love are God's reaction to it and therefore should be ours. So that's the spiral of Christian growth. We learn more about God and we act on it. And when we stall, we come to him because he's a merciful father. Knowing God is a relationship, isn't it? It's not a job. It's not a hobby. We don't just get better at acting as Christians. We grow as Christians as we grow in our relationship with Jesus. And he said to us, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. The Christian life starts with faith in Jesus, but we never, ever move on from him, do we? We never move on. We only go deeper. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for the message of the gospel. And Lord, I pray that we would truly grasp it that we would really understand your great love for us, that we would really understand that, Jesus, you who is the King of heaven, the perfect Son of God, that you came down and died for us, for me, with all of my mess and all my mistakes, Lord, help us to truly understand your grace. And God, I pray that as a church we wouldn't stop there. I pray for each person in this room that they wouldn't stall, that they would act on the things that you've revealed to us revealed to them about who you are. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that keep on growing, that keep on getting stronger as we work our spiritual muscles. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that see more clearly how wonderful and glorious and beautiful you are, and that as we look at you, we get changed. That we, Lord, I pray that there are people in this room who in a year's time are not stuck in the same uh, habits and patterns and sinful addictions that they're in now because they've spent time gazing upon you and, and, and enacting what they see in your character. Lord, I pray that in, in a year's time, in five years' time, in ten years' time, we would be a church that have grown in our love for you, that we've grown in our love for one another. Lord, that we would be a church that keep on growing to be more like Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. And we're going to come to a time of